Cool. Thank you, Michael. Um, do apologize. Um, obviously, this is a very late switch up. So if everyone was like, anyone was like expecting to learn how to submit themes, um, this is this is a different talk. Um, quick uh, background. So we're talking about uh, creating a lead mean lead generation machine. Um, go easy on me. This is a fresh uh, presentation. Haven't done this before, but let's get going. So just a little quick intro about me. Um, so my name is Robert. I'm one of the solutions engineers at WP Engine. Uh, so in terms of my background, um, Michael's already gone into WP Engine, but my background, I've started three uh, startups and exited one. Um, I love my little dog. Her name is Chelsea. Um, I like basketball and go for like a team that never wins. And um, I love do, making WordPress do crazy stuff and break. So cool. And gender of this talk um, is, whoop, is uh, about, firstly, when we're talking about creating a lead generating machine, we want to understand, OK, what are we talking about when we're creating a lead? What does a lead mean? How does that impact your business? Like, what are the steps that go towards like, that lead turning into something that's actually valuable? Um, so we want to understand the funnel first. We also want to understand, OK, what do we mean by sort of push and pull marketing? That's a very basic sort of concept of marketing. I'm sure a lot of you here have more sophisticated ways of understanding it. Um, but obviously, this is a beginner sort of um, talk. Um, and then we're going to talk about like some possible ways of, of le leveraging this kind of model. So as in like understanding social media and, and content marketing to kind of build on that initial outreach. And then talking about sort of lead generation and nurture. So things that you can do to kind of turn that person who's found your content interesting into someone who's willing to actually do business with you. And then, because I love automating everything because I'm super lazy, um, figuring out how to do that. Okay? Awesome. So um, I just want to start by saying this is good for small business owners, sole traders and freelancers, small creative agencies, um, and anyone who's looking to do um, sort of growth focused, um, gro uh, growth focused uh, who are growth focused on their business, um, but they're a little bit time poor. So this is going to be, for some people, pretty simple. Um, for others, it may introduce new things. Hopefully, you get some value out of it. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is understanding the funnel. Um, now. Who here uh, has kind of created a sales and marketing funnel before? Woo! You guys are awesome. There's like 10 hands. Awesome, great. Um, so basically, it's, it's a visualization of the customer journey. So you want to understand, okay, how do they first interact with your brand, okay? How do they understand it? What is the messaging behind it? And then going through each step to get them from becoming like, let's say, understanding your brand to kind of being interested in it to purchasing whatever it is that you're offering and then to becoming advocates of it. So as we grow, you know, and this is especially in the case when I started, oops, especially the case when I was doing startups and like creating products that no one had ever heard of and they're like, who the hell is this guy? Um, I used to say, run around trying to do sort of day-to-day -day things. I was really unstructured about the way I was doing things. I was just trying to generate business and hustle. Which I was like, hey, hustling, that's like cool. Um, but like, if you hustle without structure, you're just expending energy for no reason. And so um, without understanding what the structure is that you're using when you're hustling, it's really hard to iterate on it. It's really hard to improve. If you're like, okay, well, how, how like, how much time can I shave off running between appointments and stuff like that? That's not, that's not useful, you know? So the only really good way to understand how to kind of optimize that is by kind of mapping out that journey and creating a funnel. Um, I see a few of you have taken a shot of that. That's a very basic sort of sales and marketing funnel. So it's a good one to start with. Um, but it allows you to understand, you know, like the metrics for, or understand what sort of metrics you need to create for defining when someone has become interested you know, instead of kind of just feeling it out, or when someone is ready or has signaled sort of buying intention, instead of kind of just going, oh, they feel, they look like they might want to buy. Um, and so, like, it gives you like some metrics that you can improve on and iterate and growth, grow your business. So, the first concept I want to go into, it's very simple. Um, I'm assuming most people have heard about the difference between push and pull marketing. Who here hasn't? Everyone has heard about. Oh, you, awesome. Um, Michael, that's interesting. So, <laughs> so push and pull marketing is, is really simple. It's just about understanding, OK, um, where is the direction of that message coming from? Are you pushing it to a broad um, spectrum um, or audience? Or are you creating content which is engaging so that people are wanting to actually engage it with themselves? So pull marketing, bringing people towards it. Um, neither is better than the other, 
um, I would say. So it's important to kind of deploy them at different points uh, within the funnel to achieve different things. Um, so we're going to pick on a couple, um, and hopefully I'm going to be able to provide you some actual insights that you guys can deploy today. All right, first one, social media. Okay, awesome. Um, so social media, obviously, everyone uses it. There's a huge amount of eyeballs. Um, as of 2019, uh, users spend 15% of their time awake on social media, which is like when you think about it, like instead of thinking about how many viewers you get, or how many visitors, or how many users are on that, it's a huge amount of screen time and a massive market to play with. And so it's a really easy and cheap one to start with. And so, um, for example, um, one of the things that you can, it's, it's really great about developing brand awareness as well. It's a form of sort of push marketing. Um, one of the, the, I guess, techniques um, that is potentially useful that maybe you guys can look at exploiting is called ingredient marketing. Um, so just to give you an idea of how that works, um, does everyone know Intel? Yes. No one, does anyone, anyone not know Intel? You don't, okay. So Intel is like a, um, a, a basically a CPU manufacturer, and prior to sort of the 1990s, they weren't very well known out of sort of professional circles. Um, and the way that they kind of built their brand awareness, they actually increased the brand awareness from 24%, so when they surveyed a group of customers, to 94%, was simply by like adding like a sticker to every PC. So now it's like super, it's, it's super well known, as you can see, very few people don't know about it. And so it's a really effective way to, um, uh, market, they're always lurking, um, and basically over that period where they were able to increase their brand awareness, okay, they saw a four times increase in revenue. And so brand awareness really does correlate to like the business that you're trying to build. Oop. Um, this was um, this is some metrics that Hootsuite has done just recently, I believe, like just at the start of this year. So these are super recent. The only reason why I kind of wanted to point this out is it kind of demonstrates to you kind of the size of each market we're working with. Feel free to take a picture; it's really useful. Um, the key thing now with social media, as I mentioned, it's it's really an intrinsic part of the human digital identity. And so, unlike other platforms, which can seem really impersonal. Um, in the way that it works. Um, these are intent, usually people who are using these use it in inter intensely um, personal ways. And so oftentimes when you're engaging with them on with push marketing, with kind of um, presenting sort of, say a message um, uh, that, that uh, perhaps like might interest them, they engage in a way that's like a little bit more personal than saying coming in a bit guarded because of the platform that they're on. And so you'll find um, that a lot of the people on here are typically really sticky. So that means like things like, for example, content, um, like for example, creating white papers or like videos and things like that, people actually watch it, okay? Because they don't have that pre, uh, preconceived notion that they're basically being sold to. Uh, I'm gonna throw, I'm gonna basically focus on the largest platform on there, which of course is Facebook. Um, and basically what I wanna be able to do is, after this, kind of show you Three really simple best practices um, that I think everyone should be observing uh, when they're using Facebook, making sure they're using them in, using them in a consistent manner to be able to co like consistently grow um, their brand awareness on social media. Um, so the first one, and these are specifically from Facebook, so these are not a secret, but if you haven't seen them, you know, they are something that you want to make sure you're always observing, you're always thinking about when you're doing anything. Um, so first one is obviously keep posts short and specific. You want to be really specific about the message you want to communicate. Um, and the reason why I say this is not just because some marketing guru said it. We actually did a study with, I believe it was Advanced Genomics. Is that right, Mark? Sure. Well, the Gen Z study, what was it called? Uh, yes. That, yes, the Center of Something Generational Kinetics. Um, and basically what they found was that um, millennials have a 12-second attention span, right? Which is cool, you know, because Gen Z, which is the most recent generation, as in people who are like now attending university and stuff, who engage with these platforms, has an eight second attention span. So this is a trend that's continually decreasing. So in terms of attention span, you only have about eight seconds to work with before you lose you know, their, uh, their, their buy-in, basically. So it's, it's really, re re that's the reason why it's really important to keep kind of posts short and specific. Um, uh, pictures are really good. Uh, you want to post frequently and timely. Um, I think this is really um, 
uh, also a, a best practice. So obviously with the amount of noise generated these days in terms of content, um, there is more content developed e around the world within two days now than like your grandparents would have consumed in their entire lifetime. So it's like, how do you stick out from that? And there's no really like one magic bullet. And this applies to not just social media, but any sort of form of like marketing where you're involving content. Um, you want it to be consistent and you want to time it correctly for maximum impact and you want to keep doing it over and over again. We typically find the best times to post are um, like based around the workday for our particular industry. It may be different for your industry, so something I always recommend is to understand your customer by doing sort of focused testing groups, asking them the right questions about you know, like when do you view like social media and stuff like that. Um, so we find like for example eight o'clock in the morning, uh, 4.30 p.m. just before they go home because everyone's kind of a bit lazy, they're checked out by that point. And also um, during lunch is, is, is a good time for, for social media. And finally, highlight and engage with customers. This is, this is something that, um, whoops, sorry, I didn't even go through here. I was clicking the wrong computer. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so highlight and engage with customers. Um, this is one of the unique things about social media and the reason why I brought it up. Most push marketing, of course, is just broad-based. Like, if you send something through TV, it's not like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory where you can interact with the customer afterwards, right? You kind of just sit it out there and hope. It's like a billboard. Um, but the thing is, with um, social media marketing, of course, is when you push something out, you're able to get a response. And it's really important that when you do get a response, put some effort into responding back because it's actually the most powerful way to demonstrate the core message of your brand. Um, now, in terms of, like, what I mean by that is... This adds an element of what I call social proofing, okay? It's much more powerful to show or demonstrate why you are or you do what you do rather than just telling people because that's what push marketing essentially does. But it gives you the opportunity to demonstrate it, okay? All right. Also, people love a bit of free promotion, so it's always great. Cool. Um, so that kind of takes care of social media marketing. The next thing I kind of want to go into is content marketing. Um, so we're talking about sort of blogs and videos. I think there's a really big misnomer, uh, especially like with like content marketing and um, WordPress. So a lot of people are like, oh, I want to create content. And so they start writing as many articles as they can. Okay. But the thing is like we recently kind of did a review of um, Google's search policies around, uh, you know, search engine optimization, how they rank, you know, websites for, you know, relevance and importance. It actually turns out that it's not necessarily content, it's just general domain authority. So when we talk about content marketing, we should not only be talking about the standard things like blogs and videos, etc., um, but also things like, for example, guest posts or guest spots on podcasts or like speaking engagements like this, you know, or, you know, like, uh, uh, say, for example, creating memes, even. Like that, that, is a, that is a genuine way of creating like, good content marketing. 78% of consumers trust brands that publish their own content, okay? And if you're just relying on kind of written content, that becomes really kind of stayed. So you want to be like really varied in the way um, that you kind of develop that need in people, okay, in an uh, entertaining way. All right, so. And one of the ways that I like to whenever I write sort of content or whenever I create content is to answer these kind of five questions, something like an acronym that I try and remember for myself. And so that every time I create a piece of content, it's always trying to, you know, um, adhere to each of these. And that is, I call it Tessa, but it's targeted, it's engaging, and that means it's content that's like, not, not just polished, like sometimes raw content is really awesome. Um, it's shareable, so it's able to help others and help others build their own brands. Um, and story-driven, that's really important as well. A lot of people forget, like you do a listicle, there's not a whole lot of story in that, but it's, you know, being story-driven builds that engagement. And finally, it's authoritative, because that's what Google looks at. Do you know what you're talking about? Do other people think you know what you're talking about? Are you a trusted source, okay? So one of the things I kind of like, like talking about is kind of, um, we call it like, there's a concept called the content hacker. Um, I kind of read about this um, sort of on, a, on another website, but like basically um, what you want to look for, I guess, uh, in creating content apart from like answering, and to answer these questions, first thing I would say is like look for fit, okay? And that answers the question of being targeted. So it's like understand your customer, what do they want to see? It's very different, you know? to say creating location specific content for let's say AR or video games or something. Um, if let's say your target market, like you suddenly start like sending it to, I don't know, geriatrics care kind of facilities, it doesn't work, right? So you need to understand that. 
You need to think about how this is going to grow your business and not just simply add to a pile of content that never gets read. Thirdly, you need to think, okay, what is the current market trend? Is there an opportunity for me to add value? Is it something that you know, I can demonstrate expertise in and rapidly build that authority that Google is going to refer back to? Um, you also want to basically be able to create sustainable content. A lot of people I find when they create content, especially if they're not following like, like a specific content strategy, is that they're going to create really specific pieces of content that are time bound. And then after that time, it's like, hey, I can't use this anymore, I'm gonna delete it, or I'm just gonna archive it, put it somewhere else, right? Um, it's really important as you grow and scale, it gets harder and harder to do that over and over again. So creating like evergreen content that you can constantly publish is also a really useful exercise. So understanding how it's gonna affect not just now, but also like future readers. And then also, I brought it up before, but like SEO minded, so for so make sure that you know, you, you're able to um, understand you know, how Google is understanding your, your content um, and, and format it for that. Um, uh, I think that's about it. Um, next thing I wanna kinda go into is each of these steps in terms of targeting. Um, now in terms of like targeting, I've kind of talked, oh it's really important to understand your audience and stuff like that, but what are some tools you can use to do that with? Um, and so something that you might wanna look at, and I typically use like kind of a um, startup methodology when I come to sort of iterating my content, that is you hypothesize something that you feel that your target audience might like, you test it by writing some articles and see what sort of response you get and then to iterate. But in order to be able to iterate and understand what sort of response you're getting, you need these kind of tools. So. One of the things I typically re recommend is uh, Monster Insights. It's a really good analytics solution. Just generate, you know, it just generates data from Google Analytics, um, and uh, you're able to really easily understand, you know, what is resonating with your customer, and so you can just do more of that. Okay. It adds a dashboard that shows sort of where people are coming from to consume your content. So it, it gives you a good idea of the channels that you're using and how effective they are. Um, and it also comes with uh, WooCommerce tracking as well. So anyone using e-commerce, that, that helps because you understand how people are kind of moving from there to cart. Um, the other one I kind of just brought up um, is, uh, hang on a sec, is uh, exact metrics, okay? So they're a little bit um, more, I would say, comprehensive, um, and uh, that's another one you want to kind of check out as a, an option. Oh, sorry, I talk really fast, my apologies. So the first one is uh, Monster Insights, okay? Um, they're the ones that make, I think it's a Google Analytics dashboard for WordPress, but Monster Insights, you look that up, you should be able to find it. Um, and the other one is called Exact Metrics, one word. Cool. Right, so um, the other thing I kind of want to get into, it's really brief, but effectively, like, um, there's no point creating content if no one reads it, right? Um, and I, I, I really hate sort of clickbaity content, um, but um, headings do matter, okay? It's the thing, it impacts your SEO significantly. And so without a great title, no one's gonna read it, and so your content is kind of pointless. This um, title here, the reason why I brought it out is, everyone knows The Onion, it's kind of that, Yep, yep, see a lot of nodding heads. This is one of the first um, titles that they created and kind of sparked the direction of the entire um, kind of publication and the way that they approach uh, their um, content. Okay, so titles are really powerful. The second thing I wanna say, of course, we're talking about sharing before, you wanna encourage sharing and engagement from your users. Um, so, for example, one of the tools you may want to look at, um, it's called Sassy, Sassy Social Share. One of the other things I would also recommend, I come from sort of uh, that, like I said, the engineering background. These kind of tools, they can be a little bit heavy um, on your site, so make sure you kind of vet it. Make sure you have a sort of performance budget so you understand how it's impacting your site's performance when you add these and kind of measure before and after, and then determine, is this going to be worthwhile um, versus sort of the performance impact it's gonna give. Um, so you can see like there's a ton of options. It supports heaps of social media kind of channels. Um, it it uh, supports that social share counting thing that creates that element of social proofing. And like uh, many um, other kind of social media plugins, uh, you're able to uh, use third party services to retrieve those stats. And then also, like I was talking about story-driven, one of the, I guess, misnomers about story-driven is a lot of times when I talk, when, pe when I say story-driven, a lot of people think, okay, I need to paint like a narrative, you know, of, you know, whatever thing I'm doing. Oftentimes it's simpler than that. So for example, um, one, one kind of, 
personal example that I have is when I was in um, Singapore and I was working in an accelerator, one of the really, really effective ways that one of the other startups that I was working alongside was able to kind of reach their audience and really grow exponentially was to create like a developer diary. So they ended up just like creating a diary of their own experiences, writing it as if they were just talking to themselves, but actually sharing it with the world. And through that, it actually created a lot of value for other people who in sort of a similar situation, kind of developing products, even if they were just developers, they weren't actually working on a startup. It actually generated a lot of interest in his own, um, his own startup himself, his own brand. Uh, and so don't just think about um, like ways you can create narratives and, and just target it to the customer. Think about your own personal narrative. Think about the way that you, know, you have come to the brand yourself, you have come to create your own business and illustrate that for the customer as well because that's often more, more interesting than anything else you can formulate. Um, also, one thing, longer is better, develop domain authority. So there's a lot of obviously articles out there who talk about, hey, keep it to 600 words or something like that. Um, and that sort of thing is kind of becoming less and less valuable. As I mentioned earlier, content is really exploding. To really get domain authority now, to, Google, to get Google to really respect what you do, you have to really develop expertise in a niche and you have to demonstrate it. You can't simply write 600 word articles on like a range of things, unless you're like Buzzfeed, okay? And so what that means is, and I did like some research around this, um, Neil Patel did a study on this as well. You know, he found that for search related articles, the top 10 articles in sort of, I think he did like something like 90 different searches or something like that. The ones that ranked in the top 10 were typically 2,000 words on average, okay? So the big takeaway is that content rich sites with really, really niche domain authority are the ones that are found most useful by Google and typically most useful by the people who use it as well, okay? So make sure you put that effort in. Again, you wanna think about sustainability, these kind of articles you want to be able to reuse them. It's no use kind of creating a 2,000 word article that only lasts for a week, right? So there's that consideration you have to put into account. Okay, so we get into sort of some of the meat of this. Um, so next thing I kind of want to talk about is lead qualification nurture. So we've already talked about, you know, building awareness, um, generating interest in your brand. How do you now get that interest into a form where you're able to, um, I guess, capitalize on it? You know what I mean? It's a business, right? You're gonna make money. Um, and so one thing to keep in mind is, of course, we're in a digital age, so customers are more educated than ever. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you're not simply just selling whatever service you're creating. You wanna be consultative in the way that you reach your customers. You wanna understand what their problems are and you want to be able to like, directly talk to them, okay? So I'm gonna go through a few things um, that goes into that. First thing I wanna go into is um, CRMs. Who uses a CRM at the moment with their business? Oh, that's less than I expected. Cool. So CRM stands for Customer Relationship Management, kind of takes over kind of that role of, um, how can I say, your diary, you know? Oftentimes if you're running around as sort of a freelancer, or you're running around as a small business, like trying to keep track of all the interactions you have with all the customers is a mind-boggling affair. And so you wanna be able to offload that, and that's what CRMs are able to do. They're called Client, client Relationship Management Tools. So, just a few stats just to indicate how important these things are and why they're so ubiquitous in larger organizations. Um, without a CRM, Pato has found that 79% uh, of leads fail to convert, which is a huge amount, okay? Um, based on the uh, compounded annual growth rate um, that businesses receive from implementing a CRM, average um, compound annual growth rate is 15.1%. It's pretty high. And for implementing a CRM, the typical business sees a return on investment of $5 per dollar invested. So it's a pretty high value activity. Okay, all right, so let's talk about like how you manage these, like once you've implemented a CRM, how do you manage that, okay? So the first thing is you, you let's say we're talking about nurturing the lead, the first thing you wanna understand is, let's say someone's put in a, a contact form inquiry, right? And you've got that through to your inbox, you want to make sure that you, um, respond to that immediately. And the reason why I say this is, it's not because like, you know, like that's just the right thing to do. As I mentioned, um, the market nowadays is really saturated. So it's likely that this person has submitted a contact form to, you know, a number of other businesses. Inside sales has found that, you know, 
35 uh, to 50% of sales uh, that go to, 35 to 55% of sales actually go to the vendor that responds first. So oftentimes just being first to respond wins you the deal, which is pretty weird. Um, HubSpot also found that the longer you take to respond to that inquiry, the less, the exponentially less likely you're gonna get that deal. The second thing is maintaining constant contact, okay? And so there was a study um, done by Genius.com um, about um, consistent contact with customers and they found that um, when they surveyed buyers, um, buyers indicated that, or 66% of the buyers indicated that consistent and relevant communication provided by the sales and marketing organizations of a company uh, were a key influence in helping them decide what sort of solution they want to help grow their own business. Um, and so you want to make sure that you capture every lead that you can. You make sure you like contact them on a regular basis so they don't fall through the cracks. Because two-thirds of the time, that is what actually leads to you losing out. Third thing, as I mentioned, you want to be consultative. Too often, and this especially comes from that transition from push marketing to pull marketing, we just kind of feature list. You know, if someone says, hey, I have a problem, you just, great, I can fix it. Look at this, 5,000 things to use, right? But you're not really understanding what their problem is. You haven't, un you haven't talked to them. You haven't kind of like uh, drilled into it and kind of pulled it apart. And that means like you haven't been able to really provide value. You know, and so you want to be able to, to do that um, sort of obviously in a scalable way. And one of the scalable ways of being able to do that is kind of using something called sort of drip campaigns. You want to be able to nurture them through, let's say, email or a number of different channels. Drip campaigns have evolved from emails. Um, and you want to understand, like, there are two questions that I typically like to understand. It's like, what are the challenges are they facing? Okay. And what are the questions are they asking about the solution? Instead of trying to go, here's some features, they're awesome. This is great because it allows you to set up like when you eventually do actually like meet them or, or have a meeting with them or you actually talk to them, you're able to have a much warmer conversation, you have some context, okay? Um, the last thing I would say is, of course, um, you want to be able to create advocates, even if you don't win over their business. Being professional, being able to conduct um, your business in a way where you're creating value for this customer, even if they find your product is not a fit, they will tell other people about your product. And this is the most powerful way of generating business. It creates a network effect. And so even though, let's say, you know, someone has kind of, um, from, a, from a lead gen or lead nurturing perspective, um, one way you can do this is, instead of simply cutting off communication, put them into a marketing nurture sort of campaign or something like that. Constantly reach out to them about sort of new developments, um, sort of, say, events that you're holding or whether you'll be in town and stuff. Even if they're not going to be your customer, grab a coffee with them, you know? People love that. All right. This actually goes into CRM next, so I kind of went a little bit ass backwards. That's all cool. Um, so, um, I will... I will probably... Skip this one for now. Okay, awesome. Oh, cool. So this is kind of the last step. Um, we're getting to the end of our time anyway, so this is good. Um, so we're talking about automating it now. So we've already talked about, okay, how do we generate awareness? How do we build that interest? And then how do we nurture that lead? Let's say you start to get busy, you start to grow. It gets really hard to do all of those steps in a way you know, that's scalable, especially if you're kind of doing them by hand. So some of the ways you can kind of win this process is by using WordPress, because WordPress is so powerful with kind of that native REST API. It allows you to basically use so many different tools that you're able to kind of automate a lot of that process. So basically, we've already gone into the funnel, so I don't need to really review in that. Okay. Um, let's see. So some of the things that I like to do, um, basically, there is about, as Michael said, over 50,000 plugins that you can kind of leverage for WordPress. So which one of the plugins are, are gonna work for you? And also, because there's a REST API as well, there's a number of other things that you can connect with it that don't need to be a plugin. A couple of the tools that I like to use, just as a preface before I get into the actual recipe itself, um, that are really simple to leverage and don't require a whole lot of knowledge and expertise to get working, uh, one's called Zapier. Okay, it's that, uh, um, how can I say, it's that little like um, eight-sided star with a cer white circle in the middle, and also IFTTT, or if this, then that, okay? And these are like, they're not enterprise grade, but you know, like they're super easy to get going, okay? I recommend you have a look at them. All right, cool. 
This is the cool bit. Okay, so this is what I like to call a really basic automation recipe, okay? It's something that like anyone can get going really easily. It doesn't rely on any sort of tools that require a high level of expertise, but it does allow you to be super effective in the way that you kind of not only build awareness, create interest, but also kind of nurture those leads and, and build growth um, in sales in your business. So the first thing I would say is everything kind of hinges on content. Okay, so we start with um, WordPress, bottom left-hand corner. And so when you publish that WordPress content, maybe on that WordPress content, you wanna put something like WP Forms in there to be, able, to be able to capture leads directly on the page. But also, not everyone's going to go to that web page, right? So you need to exploit other channels as well. So something like a tool that I like using is called Buffer. I'm not sure if anyone here uses it. Does anyone use Buffer at the moment? You got four, five, six people, awesome. Um, the reason why I like using Buffer is it's super simple to use. You don't need to worry about creating a big ass, you know, um, uh, annual marketing campaign calendar or anything like that. You just set it on an ongoing basis. So you can say, okay, every like two times a day, publish whatever is next on the feed, you know, that sort of thing. And you want to be able to push them through to the particular channels or social media channels that are applicable to you. Of course, Facebook, one of the biggest ones out there. Instagram is another one that integrates with Buffer. And of course, LinkedIn, if you're doing anything that's B2B related. All right, awesome. And that basically funnels people back into the website. Now, once someone has submitted um, their uh, details into the contact form using something like Zapier, you can push it into um, straight into something like MailChimp, or if you want to use an in between, there's actually a tool called, I believe it's called CRM for WordPress that actually converts a WordPress install into a CRM. So it allows you to manage everything within WordPress. So that can be like a separate install that you kind of push it into. And then from MailChimp, MailChimp has a huge number of um, integrations itself. What I like to do is um, you want to basically They've already, con or they've already viewed your contact on, say, less what I call invasive channels, okay? Now you want to kind of leverage some of the more, uh, I guess, um, closer channels to the customer. Of course, email is a really simple one. MailChimp already handles that. Um, but you also want to leverage SMS. Um, I believe there's already been studies done that typically about 70% of people when they receive an SMS will engage with it. It's just an innate sort of human thing. You see that little red dot on your phone, you want to look at it, right? And so a platform that works really well is called Twilio that I recommend everyone check out. It actually is enterprise grade. A lot of companies use that for their own SMS platform, okay? But it's super simple to use. So you can check that out. Another one you might want to look at is EngageSpark, which is a little bit cheaper. Um, another really quir uh, good quirk that I like using in the particular funnels that I use um, is uh, that little tool down there. It looks like an X in a, um, a box. It's called X.AI. It's actually a startup that developed um, an artificial intelligence scheduling bot. Okay, they're based out of San Francisco. And what it does, it, it actually um, scans the emails and it actually communicates with your customer automatically to schedule time for you to be able to give them a call. Okay, so you know those times where you spend time kind of sending emails and going, I'm available at four, they're like, I'm not available at four, how about five, I'm not available at five, that sort of thing. That is taken entirely out of your um, scope and you can actually build it, that into each step within your drip marketing campaign that allows you to push people through the process towards sale without you ever being involved. Um, and then finally, X.AI basically puts an appointment in your calendar for you to be able to talk to the customer. Uh, and that, uh, that brings me to the end of that recipe. Okay, so hopefully through this presentation, you've kind of gotten a base understanding of creating awareness, uh, building interest in the particular brand that you have, and then also nurturing that lead, but then also using those, that kind of knowledge or those kind of tools and putting that into an automated recipe so you can kind of get really efficient in the way that you engage with people and only deal with sort of the, the stuff that's really high value so you can really accelerate the growth of your business. All right, that brings me to the end of my very impromptu presentation. <laughs> Do we have any questions? No? Oh, you're on there. I was hoping no one would put their hand up. <laughs> <laughs> Go hey, That was really good, thank you. Um, thank I you. didn't quite get the name of the SMS. Um, Twilio. Twilio. So How do you spell that? T-W-I-L-I-O. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Cool, yeah. thanks. It's super handy. I'm going to ask a massive favor that we get some links to those logos.
Oh, sure. We can do that later. This content's all going to be available later. It's been filmed, um, so we will get some reference there. I can do. Excuse can me. do. Right. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Um, Sorry, what's your name? Ian. Ian, nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, you had a picture there of uh, Onion. Yep. That newspaper. Well, yep. I didn't get your drift there with the words that were um, blanked out. I knew what they were. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, they told me that they're naughty, so I can't put them up. Were you... <laughs> putting it up as a good example or a bad example? That one, that's a good example because it allowed you to contemplate it and understand it. Sometimes um, uh, it's not necessarily about the, the content within the, the title, it's the fact that you reacted to it. So that was a really good, um, that was a really good title. And I know I am like you, I hate clickbait titles, but the point of that is that you hate it. <laughs> so it means you're engaging with it. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any specific recommendations for WordPress plugins that connect with Buffer? There is a little icon there, but... Sure. Um, I believe there already is an integration uh, between Buffer and WordPress, but I'll double check that afterwards. Anyone else, guys? All right. Well, let's call it then. Big round of applause again.